with the right leadership, much of the frustration and uncertainty of the characterized the conservative movement at present will fade away as it has in the past when Taft, Goldwater, Reagan, and Gingrich were the acknowledged leaders and did use that leadership to bring people together. When the day comes as it will, when the conservative movement unites behind the right leader and puts him on course to enter the White House, the question will be raised, can conservatives govern? I just want to briefly answer that. It's a reasonable question, given the glaring missteps and failures of the Bush administration. The answer is simple. Of course conservatives can govern. Of course. Going back to 1947, a Republican Congress, under the leadership of Senator Taft, cut federal spending, cut taxes, and helped lay the foundation for the policy of containment, which prevented the communists from seizing Western Europe as they had Eastern Europe. In 1981, the Reagan administration overcame the opposition of a Democratic House and passed the Economic Recovery Act, which pipped marginal tax rates across the board prepared the way for a period of unprecedented prosperity lasting more than 20 years. In 1996, the Republican Congress, under House Speaker Newt Gingrich passed over President Clinton's veto, welfare reform which substituted work for welfare and enabled the states to reduce their welfare roles by as much as 35%. That reform, by the way, was based upon an approach to welfare which Governor Reagan at first initiated back in California some 20 years before, 30 years before. The liberal historian Arthur Schlesinger wrote in 1947 that there seems no inherent obstacle to the gradual advance of socialism in the United States through a series of new deals. That's what he wrote in 1947. Fifty-five years later, George Will wrote that we had experienced the intellectual collapse of socialism around the world. Our task now is to make sure that people understand what is happening today in the United States of America. The one political constant throughout these years was the rise of the right, whose asset the national power and prominence was interrupted. Think about it. Death of leaders, calamitous defeats at the polls, constant feuding within ranks over means and ends, and the hostility of the prevailing liberal establishment. But through the power of what? The power of its ideas, linked by the priceless principle of ordered liberty. And the successful political application of those ideas the conservative movement became a major and often a dominant player in the political and economic realms of our nation. So it was, and so it is, in these times of crisis and doubt, and even fear and anger, when, when conservative values are called for, prudence, not rashness, custom, not the impulse of the moment, a transcendent faith, not a fatal conceit. Reform, not revolution. As we seek solutions to problems that seem almost unsolvable, we should recall the wisdom of T.S. Eliot, who reminded us, and this is something that we have to take with us every day as we work and work and work. He reminded us that no great cause is wholly lost because no great cause is ever wholly gained. So, new and old centurions, let's get to work. Well, we're at 9.25, and you guys must be a little bit tired by now after 
all of this talking. But maybe we've got one really tough question. A couple of softballs for you. Yeah. All right, how about we'll let Mr. Arkin go? He's a century graduate. Okay. All right. Uh, if you were to pick or, I don't know, uh, create a unified threat for the conservatives to rally against, uh, mm -hmm. what would you pick? Well, I don't think we, we should pick just one. <laughs> um, I think uh, in, the, in the area of, um, of domestic policy, why do we have all of these tea parties? Why do we have the outrage which is being expressed in the town halls? Why do we have that rally in Washington, the 9-12 rally with maybe 100,000, maybe more people? I think it is that people are, A, concerned about the growth of government on the negative side, the growth of government, the excessive rapid growth of government, and the cost of it, and a desire to hold on to their freedom. So I think we have to raise a banner of, of freedom, a banner of limited government, and say no more with regard to this increase, increasing presence of government in, in our lives. Um, on the foreign policy side, I put this in my, my lapel, day after 9-11, because uh, that morning of 9-11, I, on the way to, to the office and uh, the Heritage Foundation, which is on Capitol Hill, I passed by the Pentagon, which was smoke and flames, and partially destroyed, hundreds killed, and so forth, by the terrorist acts. And I happen to believe that we're in a protracted conflict with, uh, with terrorism with terrorists. We must take cognizance of that. Now, that's not to say that we go around trying to put half a million people or whatever the number might be in Afghanistan, uh, but we cannot ignore that fact and we must take cognizance of it and take appropriate prudential steps to oppose not only Al-Qaeda but others as well. So I think with those two things, the idea of protecting, preserving freedom at home, and also the idea of defeating those who would take away that freedom overseas is, is a pretty, pretty good rallying cry for us in, in, the, uh, in the months and years ahead. 